as you said, my name's Marcus. I work for BMC Software. They're the, an American-based software company, and uh, they're based in Texas, but they've got people all over the world, um, development in India, um, Tel Aviv, and Cardiff, apparently. Who knew? That's me. Uh, the commute, I work from home. The commute to Texas is a bummer, so I, I try not to do that very often. And that's it. That's what I'm going to talk about. Hopefully, if technology goes well, I developed this on a, a Windows box, but I thought it would be quite hypocritical for me not to bring my Linux laptop. So, I'd like to cover what is a mainframe, uh, a brief history of time. Uh, time sharing option is a rubbish joke if you know anything about mainframes. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, what the mainframe looks like today, and so what about Linux? <coughs> so, what is a mainframe? Well, not this anymore. It used to look like that, around about 1964, but thankfully it doesn't look like that anymore. Uh, it looks a bit like that, and it is actually bigger inside than the outside, but it isn't that. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is a mainframe. This is the new IBM Z15, uh, which was uh, announced last and uh, shipped last year. So uh, when I started work, the data center I worked at in Port Albert Steelworks was about four times the size of this room, easily, possibly five. And it was just like the first slide, wall to wall, banks of whirring tapes and flashing lights and consoles and everything. And when I left, six years later, we had something a little bit bigger than that, alone in the same room. It was all cleared and replaced by something a little bit bigger than that. So that's what technology does. It grows. So what is a mainframe? <coughs> it is not a supercomputer. It is not a dinosaur. <laughs> and it is not dead, as some people would have you believe. So the main difference between a supercomputer and a mainframe are those. Uh, supercomputers generally scientific engineering problems, very good number crunching and data analytics. Measured in flops, floating operations per second, it's very good for high speed computations, mostly runs Linux. The mainframe, however, is mainly for transaction processing and data processing. It does do data analytics, it's measured in MIPS, which is millions of instructions per second. It's got very high speed throughput, mostly runs IBM's proprietary operating system ZOS or ZOS, I'm starting to learn to say since uh, I've been working for an American company, and ZVM, which is virtual mem memory, and now runs Linux. And it's famous for its high, re high reliability, availability, and serviceability. So, here's a brief history of time. I've got a script here, if you don't mind. In the 50s, before solid-state electronics, computers were built in separate large cabinets or frames, housing the CPU, memory, I.O. units, and storage units. The cabinet that held the CPU was called the main frame. Who knew? <laughs> so, the large, a large computer room a large computer needed a large building, so by the 60s and 70s, semiconductors meant that the CPU and main storage, or memory, uh, could be housed together in one cabinet. Uh, now, a computer that was housed in a single hall, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, can now be housed in a little bit bigger than an American fridge freezer. So, the introduction of the S3, where is that? Oh, that's the wrong button. Oh. Never let me alone with technology. The S360 was the first main operating system in 1964, heralded the dawn of a new age in computing. 
It was the first general purpose computer, not just scientific or commercial. So programs were written in Assembler, Fortran, COBOL, PL1. Uh, in the 70s, S370 operating or machine brought in um, TSO, which is time sharing option, which was uh, the scheduler gave each user a different slice of the CPU for a fraction of a second. So that was basically a um, proto-parallelism, if you want to call it. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, you had um, virtual memory coming along, virtual addressing, 31-bit, and then expanded storage. You had LPAS, logical partitions coming along. Uh, the CPU could be obstructed, which meant that you could have a service layer above your physical CPUs which then could be split into as many logical CPUs as you wanted. And each logical CPU could house its own copy of the operating system. So you had multiple virtual systems, MVS. And MVS was the basically the, the start of what we now know as the, the main multitasking mainframe operating system. By the 90s, uh, Linux, came along the mid 90s and by 1999 um, IBM had made some changes to the Linux kernel which allowed it to run on the uh, S390 is that there not there uh, that would be about there yeah the S390 um, operating system uh, not operating system hardware so Linux could run on the S390 hardware ZOS Z stands for zero as in zero downtime. Um, that was true. <laughs> I'll tell about that in a minute. Uh, that is the operating system that we're on now, and ZOS 2.4 is the current operating system which runs on the mainframe. So, that box is now available as one or four. 19 inch frames stuck together. Uh, it's got new 12 core 14 nanometer CPUs, each running at 5.2 gigahertz. You can have one up to 190 configurable cores in one mainframe. It's got 40 terabytes of redundant array independent memory, which is uh, once again IBM's uh, patent. It's got on chip compression processor, co processor reduces I.O. rates and storage, and it's got an onboard cryptographic coprocessor that encrypts data both in flight and at rest. So yeah, as your data goes out, it's compressed, then encrypted, because if you encrypt before you compress it, then you can't compress it. So um, you, you can also exploit blockchain, AI and, and ML with co-located analytics processors, and it has got, if you can wire it up correctly, 99.999, and in, there are some instances where it's seven nines, uh, uptime, which is three seconds per year downtime. It's also got up to 600 processing calls just for moving data. So this is a data monster. It's not a scientific brain. It's for shunting data very, very fast and very, very reliably. you can have up to 85 dynamically managed logical partitions. So 85 different computer operating systems all running on the same hardware. It's got redundancy and self-checking built in. You can have data sharing across partitions. So you can have separate uh, partitions all accessing the same data. So if one partition was to fail over, then the other three would pick up the workload without any difference or any hit to the user whatsoever. Therefore, it's got dynamic workload management. It's got hot swappable hardware, which means that it's got impact free upgrades of the operating system, the software, and the hardware. So, someone once said it's like changing the engine of a Formula One car while it's moving without losing speed. It can handle a trillion secure web transactions a day, 2.4 million containers, so Docker containers on a single system, and IMS 13 which is the latest version of Apollo 11's database management system, now manages 100,000 transactions per second. So it's a fast beast. 
seventy one percent of Fortune companies, Fortune one hundred companies, sorry, I should say, uh, have mainframes. Ninety six of the world's top hundred banks, twenty three of the world's top twenty five retailers, all of the world's top insurers. Ninety percent of all fin fin financial transactions all go through mainframe. Even Apple have got one. So, have you used a mainframe today? Chances are, if you've got a bank or credit card account, or you've got a smartphone, and have used your smartphone today, you've probably used a mainframe somewhere. So, what about Linux? As I said, support was added in '99. The Linux One, that impressive beast, was launched in 2015. It runs these distributions. <coughs> And by running, now this is pretty crazy diagram. So over here on the left-hand side, uh, you've got four physical CPUs split into eight logical CPUs with one partition running on four, another partition running on another four, and the ZOS operating system running on each logical partition. So if one was to take a hit, the other one would still be up and running nicely. Um, <clears throat> also in the mainframe, you can have IFLs, Integrated Facility for Linux, which is uh, a chip designed, it's basically a general processing mainframe chip, one of these 5.2 gigahertz, 12 core things, but specifically designed for running Linux workloads. So you can have four physical CPUs there, running two LPARs, each LPAR hosting ZVM, which is another mainframe virtual management, virtual memory operating system. And those two could run all those number of Linux partitions themselves. You can even abstract it further and have ZVM running on ZVM and Linux running on that. Now, VM, virtual memory as an operating system, has an ability to overcommit system resources to do more with less. So you can host an environment from two actual physical CPUs, and from those two CPUs, Z, uh, ZVM can host 50 individual Linux instances, each on their own virtual CPU, using the capacity of the physical CPUs down there. So you can buy software, software licensed to run on two CPUs. You can run on 50 virtual CPUs. So why would you want to run Linux on Z? Uh, you can consolidate more servers, spend less on software. Uh, you can manage more server Im images with fewer people. There's a, so there's a 50% improvement in staff productivity, 80% improvement on energy and floor space. You can dis deploy new servers and applications in a spin. It's less complex, security is tighter, um, and it uses the existing established mainframe technology. It's reliable, scalable, yada, yada, yada. And you've also got this um, onboard hardware compression and encryption. So, an insurance company consolidated 292 Linux servers onto a single mainframe. It had been running HP and Sun servers in more 500 cores, all running around average 30%. After moving to a system Z with 22 uh, Linux chips, bespoke Linux chips running Linux on ZVM, reduced its floor, pace, floor space by 97%, heat production by 93%, and energy by 95%. So consolidate. So some examples of usage for a Linux system on Z. Uh, server consolidation, DevOps, containers. The list is quite literally in front of you. Uh, some brief stats. So here's uh, some performance metrics. Uh, Postgres <coughs> performance, um, Z15 versus X86 Skylake. There's uh, a 2.3 times more throughput on eight cores on the Z15 than on a uh, comparable x86 platform. Um, mm. 
So that was, yes, that's the stats for the previous benchmark. And here, the day trader 7 benchmark on WebSphere was 2.6 times more throughput on two cores on a Z15 versus a comparable x86 platform running WebSphere applications over Liberty. And how do you say that? Is it NGINX? Nginx. Nginx. Nginx, thank you. I never knew how to say that. I've learned something today. It isn't very really often you get to say, I learned something in my own presentation. <laughs> Ng Nginx. So, each web server produced 618,000 HTTP transactions per second. <coughs> It executed up to a trillion transactions a day on a single Z server. Uh, it consolidated a hundred x86 servers, um, improving utilization from 23% to 88% on mainframe. Um, and it ran 2.3 times more Docker containers per core on the ZL part versus uh, the bare metal x86 platform. So, yes, you can do more with less, basically. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. A uh, bit, bit about my company. We're global, 10,000 customers worldwide. We concentrate on uh, mainframe software development and um, enterprise level service. Uh, we do um, security uh, across. Uh, we provide security software and workflow software for enterprise uh, companies, so like Linux and stuff. But there you go. I'd like to thank BMC, IBM, and RSM partners for some information that went into this presentation. Thank you very much. Questions, if you like. Yeah, go on. What's the timing uh, then for Linux hosts on mainframes? Are they becoming more popular than, Z than using some non Linux devices? What's the you know, what's sort of pattern since it's coming? So, your typical mainframe customer would be banks, insurers, um, commerce, big commerce okay. companies, Tesco, uh, every major um, supermarket as mainframes. Uh, there isn't as much traction in consolidation as there could be because the amount of effort that's involved. But that one insurance company consolidated 292 Linux servers onto one Z15 mainframe. <coughs> um, immediately saw the benefit because rather than having Sys Adams running all of these uh, Linux servers, you already had the sysadms running the mainframe and they just absorbed the extra workload because it's just it's pretty much self-managing. So not as much as we like. Was there another question? What's the cost of one, one rack? Right, so okay, one, well they're not in racks, they're frames. So one frame, dep it depends what software you're running on it and it depends on the agreement that you have with IBM running uh, um, how much CPU you're using. It can vary between the high hundreds of thousands to about five million. If you're running far, four frames, uh, massively parallel, 190 cores per frame, then that would be in the five million lot, uh, range. For the engineers in your business get one each for the <laughs> Um, we, uh, I worked in a, <laughs> I worked in a local high speed bank uh, for twenty years, and we had four um, LPARs running on two CPUs for development, then eight LPARs running on two CPUs for QA testing, and then another eight LPARs running on eight CPUs for production. 
and that's the forty percent of the, every single financial transaction of the UK. No, went from all um, they call them sysplex, system complex. So we had uh, two mainframes in one data center, another two mainframes up north. So they were, and there was not instant failover because cable uh, or fiber, but it was a pretty, pretty good failover. I think um, the tests, the, the whole system was down for about 15 minutes. If you crashed a whole system and brought it back up on the other, but it depends on your configuration, you can have instant recovery with uh, with the new Z15. And the number of start five nines reliability or three seconds a year or something like that. Yeah. What does that actually mean in practice? I mean, what's what? How do they just tell that number? Because anything goes wrong, you've kind of lost your your availability budget for the next few centuries. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's okay. Does it actually go down at all in reality? In reality, no. It doesn't go down. And if anything does go down, uh, there's redundancy and self-checking built in. So I know of um, one LPAR, which is a logical partition running its own workload uh, on a virtual CPU above the physical CPUs. <laughs> Uh, that went down, and nobody noticed that the workload had all automatically shifted to the other three until a light came on in the operations room. Um, and I know of another instance where an IBM engineer was hot swapping a CPU. Um, so basically, it was running production, 40% of all of your financial transactions running through it. And it just opened a drawer, and a CPU had, over, had overheated. Opened the drawer, pulled the CPU out. All the other CPUs took over its workload, swapped another CPU back in, and then that came online. And it was zero outage. It's so reliable. To if, if that it has that kind of level of reliability across different kind of virtual and operating systems. Why did you need separate frames? Um, they are, we, we, they're all they're all LPARs within the same frame. Okay. Um, but the LPARs shared different CPUs. So um, each each frame had eight CPUs, and we just shared the workload so that we had four dedicated CPUs for production on each of the main frames. But uh, yeah, we didn't need to. We just like to keep keep things apart because. <laughs> Users. Sure. Anything else? Can we take that offline? Again, thanks very much, Marcus.